Now what the intelligent design folks want to do is they want us to start there. They want us to start at that final complex snazzy uh, multi-component uh, 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 form and say couldn't possibly form by natural causes. But actually it's very possible for it to form. And what's kind of interesting about the I story is that there were some I think there were Swedish scientists, and I'm sorry I have seen your moment here, I don't remember the exact reference, but um, there were some, some investigators who did some computer modeling for you know, how long would it take, given such and such a mutation rate for changing the surface of the, uh, the skin and, and causing the um, uh, cup forming and the pinhole eye and the formation, you know, um, lens from crystalline structures that are already there and so forth and so on. How long would it take to evolve an eye? from something like Darwin's original pig pigmented patch. And it w found that it could be done in a, something like 100 million years or something, which geologically speaking is a drop in the bucket. Okay, so I'm going to just switch tack a little bit now and just ask you a little about the history of uh, creation science. And we spoke uh, at the beginning a little bit about intelligent design, and those two things seem to be interchangeable in a sense. And how far back does the history of creationism as a science go. It seems to be a relatively new phenomenon. It is, it is. Um, uh, from a, well in geological time it's very new, but um, cre creation science was a movement that began in the 1960s. Uh, and it began, uh, it, it was formed, okay we will start that over again. <laughs> blah, blah. What he said, and then. <laughs> Creation science got started back in the 1960s. It was a movement in response to evolution coming back into textbooks and into the high school curriculum after evolution had been pretty much uh, abandoned as a topic in, in instruction from after the Scopes trial, really, after in the approximately the 1930s. And uh, since, for a variety of reasons, evolution was coming back into the curriculum, conservative Christians were very upset about this um, because they believed that if children learn evolution, they will become atheists. And if they become atheists, then that's a really very, very bad thing. Um, it means that, in their view, they will not have any kind of moral or, or spiritual guidance, and so they will be bad people. They'll, they'll lie and cheat and steal and worse and so forth. Um, they also believe that if you don't believe in God, you're lost to salvation. So, you know, for conservative Christians, this is a very important thing, and there's a very high motivation to, to try to keep evolution out of the schools. Well, for a variety of reasons, uh, again having to do with the legal system in the United States, um, it was not possible to ban evolution, so creation science was pretty much invented to sort of ameliorate it. If you have to teach evolution, well at least teach creation science to balance it out. And creation science was the idea of taking the Christian doctrine of special creation, that, that God created everything pretty much in its present form as we see it today, specially. You know, it, it, is not accept, it, it is not compatible with evolution. There are many religious views that are, but special creation is not compatible with evolution. It's the, it's the exact opposite. Evolution has uh, living things diversifying, developing through time, having common ancestors, um, sort of like a tree. The tree is the common uh, metaphor for evolution. Well, special creation is a lawn. Each little blade of grass is a separate creation by God, and they don't come together in, in common ancestry. So that, that's completely uh, unacceptable to... Uh, um, uh, evolution and, and special creation are, are, are unacceptable, are, are uh, unable to be matched. Um, so creation science was invented as a way of trying to get that special creationist view into the schools, but the way they had to do it was claim that there was scientific validity to this view. Now, of course, it's really hard to find scientific evidence that everything appeared in its present form as we see it. I mean, there just isn't scientific evidence for that. So the main thrust of the movement was trying to disprove evolution because in their, they have this very dichotomous view that there's either evolution or there's special creation. So if you can just disprove evolution, special creation wins by default. And it was a very interesting movement that thrived in the 1970s and 80s and actually is still extant today. If you go to the internet, uh, you can find scads of websites devoted to creation science. Just Google creation science and you'll get you know, tens of thousands of sites. Lots of videos too. And where does it stand now? We have this impression from the science community we're 
very afraid that this seems to be very much on the rise, but I'm, I'm not sure if that's the case. It seems to have plateaued somewhat. Well, creation science actually is expanding. Um, it began as a movement from a man named Henry Morris, who founded uh, the California-based Institute for Creation Research. And uh, most of all of the uh, young earth creation science that we see today is really a function of Henry Morris's writings and, and inspiration. But the movement has spread. Um, the Institute for Creation Research now in Dallas, Texas is a, a very esteemed and, and um, uh, honored organization in this movement. But now there's, a, uh, for the last 10, 15 years or so, there's Answers in Genesis up in Kentucky, which opened a $15 million, $21 million museum um, open to the public, presenting young earth creationism. Uh, you know, humans and dinosaurs were created at the same time, so they played together. And, you know, <laughs> so all of these ideas that supposedly are supported by science uh, in the creation science movement uh, are very widely spread within the general public, which now, is, I think, part of the reason why we have so much uh, rejection of evolution. Now, you've been involved personally in, 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 in tackling that mm -hmm. issue, mm -hmm. um, and it's involved in a number of high-profile court cases uh, dating back, I think, the earliest was 1981 in Wisconsin, is that right? Or? Um, Arkansas? Yeah, the trial was in 81, the, the decision was in 82, and that was um, uh, McLean versus Arkansas. I actually wasn't, uh, I wasn't involved in that at that time. I was certainly watching it very carefully, though, as I was a college professor at, at that time. But um, yeah, that was a very interesting case where the state of Arkansas had passed a law requiring that if teachers taught evolution, they had to teach creation science to balance it out. And I'm glad you mem mentioned that case because uh, people don't know it very well, but it was a wonderful, wonderful example of science, really. Because the people who challenged the Arkansas law, the lead plaintiffs were religious leaders, by the way. Uh, the Reverend Bill McLean was the named plaintiff of McLean versus Arkansas. And of course, that was done deliberately to try to defuse the idea that this was about science versus religion, because it really wasn't. It was about one claim of science versus everybody else. And mainstream religion um, leaders like um, uh, Reverend Bill McLean, who was a Methodist minister, uh, and Methodist Presbyterians, Catholics, etc., didn't like the idea of creation science being taught in the public schools because that wasn't their theology. And they'd have to straighten the kids out on Saturday and Sunday about what their own theology was. So they fought these equal time bills very strongly. But the McLean case was really a wonderful case for science because um, the plaintiffs and the defense brought in these teams of scientists, creation science on one side and straight mainstream science on the other side, and they debated whether creation science was science. And uh, it was a long trial. Uh, you know, several days of testimony and, of course, a whole uh, long period of months and months of, of, of depositions and the whole business and then finally the cross-examinations. And when the dust settled, the judge wrote his decision that it was clear from the evidence presented by the mainstream scientists and not rebutted by the uh, creation scientists and the evidence presented by the creation scientists but destroyed by the mainstream scientists that creation science wasn't a science at all. Evolution was obviously strong science, acceptable science, but creation science was just religion masquerading as science and because of the establishment clause of, of our First Amendment, um, was unconstitutional to teach it. Now, unfortunately, the creationists lost so badly in that case, they never appealed it. And so a neighboring state of Louisiana had also passed equal time for creation science legislation. And that bill went was the one that went all the way to the Supreme Court. But unfortunately, without that wonderful trial where the creationists and the evolutionists squared off to debate what is science. And so we didn't get that wonderful court record into the uh, national case, which was actually argued much more narrowly on uh, documents. Now, from what I understand, and my memory has let me down here, but the ruling by... I have that problem. <laughs> uh, that that the creation science didn't fit the definition of science was very eloquently put, that it, it failed on a number of key principles. Uh, it didn't embrace falsifiability. It was resistant to change over time. And perhaps you could just speak a little Whoa, bit about Wow, you'd know a whole lot about this. <laughs> fun to talk about somebody who actually knows this case. Well, I was hoping you could, <laughs> yeah. you could take it from there. That's as much as, as far as I could go. No, that's